and at Yale University. And uh, Dr. Holmberg is our clinical and medical director of Stepping Stones here at Lakeview Health. I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you, uh, Lindsay. Uh, uh, yes, I'm Dr. Kevin Holbert. I've uh, been with Lakeview for over six years now. Um, I'm a staff physician and psychiatrist, uh, um, and with residencies in general psychiatry, psychiatric subspecialties, and family medicine. And this is a place I get to do all the work. Yes, Dr. Holbert has many, many uh, years of training. So we are really excited to talk to you today about co occurring disorders. So I'm going to flip to our pre test. There we go. All right. So these are just a couple of questions we want you guys to think about today. One is what a co occurring disorder might be, what are common co occurring disorders, and then we might for y'all to just come up with maybe three examples of treatment for co-occurring disorders. So we'll be hitting a highlights on all of these. And these are our objectives today. So we're going to talk pretty heavily about neuroscience of addiction. We're going to get into the brain, really dig in there. We're going to talk about the definition for a co-occurring disorder. I want to explain uh, the epidemiology. It's pretty in-depth clarify what key co-occurring illnesses are um, present often. We'll talk about special populations <clears throat> and highlight future directions and treatment. So to start out, this is a view of the brain from the side, kind of a, a deep section picture. And one of the common things that we think about with addiction in the brain is pathways. And you'll hear us, so Dr. Holbert and I will use that term pathways. Um, throughout today's lecture. So pathways in the brain include a couple of different ones that are involved <laughs> with addiction. You have the dopamine pathways, and then you have serotonin pathways. And as you can see, we have a number of different structures in the brain that are going to highlight when people are using drugs or alcohol. These are the structures that get involved. You have the nucleus accumbens, which you can see is pretty deep in there. You have the ventral tegmental area, BTA, exactly. And then you're going to have the prefrontal cortex. And all those three communicate with each other, and they're involved with reward. They get activated when we eat good food, when we bond with another person, when we're social. Um, sex also activates those pathways. Those are healthy areas of the brain that get involved with reward. Natural reward. Exactly. And I uh, would point out too that uh, we really wanted to note kind of where these uh, are originating in the brain, just, just positionally being in the deep brain area, deep brain structures and close structures in, in the brain that drive very basic things like breathing, hunger, uh, sex and reproduction. Right. It's, that, that's an important. Uh, that's a great. That's a great point, Dr. Holbert. And in fact, you were talking with me earlier about the prefrontal cortex. That's mm -hmm. kind of the brake of the brain. So if you think of the brain like a car, if that prefrontal cortex doesn't work, people end up doing things that are dangerous or impulsive. And as you can see, that prefrontal cortex is part of that pathway. Which can be hijacked. Which can be hijacked exactly. So. That is what we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, again, you'll hear a lot about dopamine today. So dopamine, like you were saying, is involved with reward, healthy reward. Uh, when we eat a really good meal, something we really like, that releases dopamine. And that promotes memory. It promotes a good feeling in ourselves. Our sleep is good. Our mood is good. Uh, dopamine is hijacked. I love that word that you use, hijacked, when people use drugs or alcohol. We want to point out that dopamine is a neurotransmitter, um, and it's, it's a very common neurotransmitter in this reward pathway that Dr. Joyne pointed out uh, just a moment ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's a neurotransmitter like other neurotransmitters you may hear about, like serotonin, norepinephrine, uh, but this one just particularly is involved in the, particularly in the reward pathway. That's a great point. It's going to be the star today. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite um, photographs. <laughs> so one of the things about prefrontal cortex is that, again, it's that break in the brain. It lets us um, make good decisions. It helps us from doing destructive things. 
if it doesn't work well, a lot of times you see people become impulsive and do dangerous activities, such as drugs and alcohol. Interestingly enough, for uh, young adults, even up until age, I think 26 is the research right now, your brain is still developing in that area. It's still under construction. So teenagers and young adults, if they get involved with drugs and alcohol, they have a much higher risk of problems with impulsivity and dangerous activity. And affecting uh, the appropriate maturation of this center. Mm -hmm. um, That's a great point. Influence. Right, because if drugs kind of stop production or stop construction up there, sometimes people don't ever really develop a good prefrontal cortex. Exactly. Which again is the higher thought, uh, uh, risk assessment, executive planning center in the brain, or sometimes we call it kind of the on off switch, uh, which we put in off mode whenever uh, the system gets over. Yeah, great point. So I, I like this cartoon, it's kind of fun, but basically, this is, I think you described it as a microscopic view of the brain. So we're getting really deep into cells. This is how cells in the brain talk to each other. Two nerve cells, exactly. one uh, communicating with the next, and the space in between is called a synapse. Exactly. So you can see those little balls there are chemicals. So one cell talks to the other, releases chemicals, and that just starts the whole process. I think the important thing about this picture is that, we're, again, we're talking about dopamine. Mm -hmm. And dopamine is really one of these critical chemicals in the brain when we're talking about substance use. And uh, often substances of abuse, in one way or another, will activate the dopamine channel. They can inhibit the reuptake of dopamine, uh, thus, thus enhancing mm -hmm. the transmission of dopamine. And this is really how one nerve cell talks to another. And think of billions of trillions of these cells in the brain. But uh, various substances enhance the transmission mm -hmm. of dopamine. Um, or, or, yeah, or, or, or block the reuptake of it, along with other neurotransmitters as well. Yeah. So one of the things about addiction, and I think we've all heard these terms, is there is a compulsive part of addiction, and that really is one of the big characteristics. People are compulsively using alcohol and drugs. Because you have a drink for, with dinner doesn't mean you're addicted, but if you compulsively use at the consequence of your relationships, your social status, your finances, your health, then it becomes addictive. Yeah, one often hears of the multiple fees associated right. with addiction. One of them. Compulsive <laughs> use being one of them, mm -hmm. uh, use despite consequences, right. um, cravings, and failure to cut down mm -hmm. when one tries to. Those are, the, those are important for fees. There's also that impulsive piece, and we kind of referred to that earlier with a prefrontal cortex, which is that. that which piece. helps minimize the impulsive behavior. Exactly. When it's in good control. When it's working well. Yeah. So, Another kind of picture, brain structure is involved with addiction, the cingulate is another structure. It's just like you said, it's a deeper structure in the brain. And that cingulate kind of regulates that compulsiveness. So you've got the impulsive part, which is your prefrontal. You've got the cingulate, which is the compulsive part. And then the deep limbic system, we'll talk about why it in a moment. Why the impulsive drive center? Yeah. It can be in charge in addiction. Exactly, and we'll get into that in a little bit. One of, my, one of our favorite TV shows, both of us love this show. <laughs> so Thank you for coming <laughs> The compulsiveness of yeah. sleep, yeah. Me too, I love it. But that's just an example of someone, probably, Mr. Monk has an anterior singular problem. And that's an area of uh, uh, treatment in MCD. That is a great point, yeah. yeah. And that could be a whole other uh, one. A whole other one. <laughs> So this is um, another great um, example of what gets hijacked with addiction is the deep limbic system. The limbic system sets the emotional tone for somebody. If it gets out of balance, you're going to see problems with mood, with depression. Addiction can affect this area of the brain. And thus, the manifestations that look like multiple psychiatric disorders. Exactly. Great point. So I get this question a lot. I'm sure you do too. Patients ask me, well, does my brain ever recover? Can it change back to what it was before I was using Can I turn back on my one off switch? There you go. Exactly. So, yes, you can. It does take some time. And that's what uh, I think this slide really shows. It's a great slide. Yeah. Great slide. So, on the, on the left is an example of brain activity that's healthy. 
on the right, you have brain activity that's not healthy. And, and the way you can tell is just the colors. So red and orange is good activity. Cooler colors like the green and the blue, that's lower activity. And what we know about addiction, and it's either drugs, alcohol, or even food, mm -hmm. you can lose some of that healthy activity in the brain. So the point of this, though, is that you can recover it. It takes even up to two years, I think, for right. the brain to rewire and get back that healthy activity. It depends on substance used, how much used, right. how long used, and uh, it can vary from months to years. And mm -hmm. what, what's important here is kind of goes in line with uh, the dopamine uh, theory in, in addiction. You see right. the reduced uh, concentration of dopamine receptors on the right side, exactly. uh, thus uh, uh, co corresponding with one's uh, loss of pleasure out of natural rewards. Exactly. Like somebody has used drugs for That's so long. Area it high it complete, yeah. completes the receptors, and then it takes uh, a surge, such as from cocaine or amphetamine, just to feel okay after time and after these receptors have been depleted. Yeah, yeah and, and, and I think you, you were talking with me earlier. People ask you, well, you know, how long does it take? And we're, you know, we share with them it's not even years. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people want to get better right away. Exactly. Some people think they can stop you mm -hmm. and two days later, once they're, they're ready to go back out of the intoxication yeah. phase, that they're uh, back they're ready to the next time. Yeah. But it's not. It takes time. Yeah, so it takes time. Uh, so here we go. So I think these are important um, definitions. Right. Uh, Co-occurring, we see uh, classically defined as an existence of a psychiatric disorder along with an addictive disorder, such as a really use disorder plus major depression. Mm -hmm. um, a somewhat older term was dual diagnosis, uh, when one was mainly referring to a psychiatric disorder and a substance use right. disorder. Uh, now we're kind of using co-occurring to mean psychiatric substance use and medical right. yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, you see a couple of survey results on there from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Uh, in 2014, 21 and a half million adults in the U.S. with a substance use disorder and 8.4 million of those uh, with a co-occurring psychiatric disorder. So it's That's certainly not that common. Yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's a geriatrician, um, Mary Tonetti, who I studied, and she talked about a term multimorbidity. Mm -hmm. Which is even kind of a newer term, thinking about just like you said, medical, psychiatric, and substance use all kind of flow right. into one, even adding like social issues or, or other kind of relationship issues as a problem. And we want to point out we think that is all very important here to do, and we assess that from the outside and we just treat all aspects of it. So we're just looking at everybody in a very comprehensive, comprehensive uh, way. global frame. Exactly. Yes. So really, what we do every day here, uh, enjoy it, it is a challenge at times, uh, and that is differentiating between primary psychiatric disorders uh, or symptoms from a substance use disorder that look like a psychiatric disorder, or is it a combination? And we help patients uh, learn about this presentation, what it means to have one, the other, or both, and, and help them sort it out and get pointed in the right direction for the most effective treatment. Mm -hmm. Because if it's all addressed, they're definitely going to have better outcomes. Yes, yeah, that's so important. And, and I love it mentions on this slide, you know, co coexisting psychiatric disorder symptoms may be interpreted for recovery. Yeah, so that, again, it points out they need to be identified mm -hmm. and addressed as needed. I think that's a great point because people that go into treatment and they keep relapsing, family, or even their own doctors might blame them. They're just saying, well, why can't you get this? Mm -hmm. They might not be getting it because they're not, we're missing something. Yeah. Or more than that. Or more than that, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, this is just a, a slide to emphasize that most all of the uh, psychiatric disorders that we know of can be co-occurring with substance use disorders. We should be anticipated and assessed for it. Yes. And that's a long list. It's a long list. We're going to touch on We're going to touch on most of them. We're not going to get into all of those because that's going to be a two or three more uh, webinars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I'll let you take it away, but this okay. is a very important slide. It is. Uh, I want everybody to kind of uh, look at this and think about the substance uh, use disorder, intoxication, or withdrawal can cause psychiatric symptoms or, or mimic psychiatric syndrome. That's, the, that's mm -hmm. our title today, The Great Master right. Readers. Uh, that was a great time. Uh, yeah. uh, psychiatric and substance use disorders can independently coexist 
and right at the outset, we start trying to help people figure this out if that is the case. Mm -hmm. um, psychiatric disorders can look like substance use disorders. Right. Um, for example, somebody with uh, mania may uh, appear like cocaine intoxication or methamphetamine exactly. intoxication. Um, or psychosis. Or psychosis. Or mania. Yeah. Okay. So really everyone uh, that is affected by this, interested in this, working with these patients or patients itself, comorbidity or co-occurring should be the expectation. It's not the expectation. That's what we anticipate, that's what we look toward. And how do we figure that out? Well, it requires a comprehensive assessment to determine all of these diagnoses. We're looking at as many resources as we can right. employ, gather information from, and for me, uh, a timeline evaluation. Uh, if one can remember if they had uh, depressive symptoms prior to starting uh, mm -hmm. substance use uh, or vice versa, mm -hmm. and if they have periods of sobriety, did psychiatric symptoms improve exactly. and resolve? Right. Uh, That's a key very question. helpful. That's a key question. Okay. And, and during the reassessment, here at Lacey, we're seeing people every day. During the reassessment, keeping a flexible, working, and broad differential. I, I like that, working diagnosis. Yes. So, uh, I can, yeah, right. multiple addictive substances may induce. Pretty much any of them. There's a broad category on there opiates, sedatives, hypnotic, hallucinogens, um, synthetic, synthetic drugs like spice, asphalt, methadone. Um, you have a lot of, you know, cannabis has, it plays into marijuana, plays into psychosis, but also anxiety. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, yeah, even caffeine, I know. We see caffeine withdrawal, we see caffeine uh, effects. Yes, exactly. Um, and when they're really primarily substance induced, the DSM side uh, suggests that these will develop within a month uh, of substance intoxication or withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And they're frequently shorter lived, and you know, if we have these symptoms persisting over time, uh, for months or longer, that you know, that's going to change when yeah. you're thinking about a primary co-occurring right. disorder. Because I know, you know, when we work here at Lakeview, we see someone day one, day 28, or day 30, they may look very different. Very different. Yeah, and so it's so important to really get that time for their brain to heal, clean out, we get a good assessment for evaluating them all yeah. the daily. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. So there are 11 <coughs> substance induced mental disorders that are in the DSM 5. I believe that should be 5 rather than, that's, well, it's the number. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Minor point. Um, I was just thrown because we don't use thrown numerals that much. <laughs> so you can have depression, bipolar, anxiety, OCD, psychosis, neurocognitive. Um, hallucinogenic type disorders? Pretty much all of mm -hmm. the uh, individual psychiatric uh, disorders that are recognized. Exactly. Uh, are going to talk about like this. And present a uh, right. uh, life of disorder with substance abuse. That's a lot. Um, okay. right. So epidemiology, interestingly enough, PTSD actually, studies suggest about 50% of veterans diagnosed with PTSD actually have a substance use disorder too. That's a pretty high number. So that's one in two that uh, have PTSD. And bipolar, we're seeing a lifetime prevalence of alcohol and marijuana in bipolar. 42% have alcohol use and 20% 20, 20 have a cannabis or a marijuana use disorder. That's, those are staggering numbers. Yeah, and what we want to stress with this, uh, these epidemiology slides, uh, uh, not to memorize these numbers, but right. they are significant. Yeah, and exactly. just uh, reemphasize the point that mm -hmm. this should be anticipated. Exactly, not not the exception. Right. Uh, using the psychiatric research search interview for substance and mental disorders, uh, yeah. one study conducted in folks with comorbid substance use and psychiatric mm -hmm. disorders, 41 percent of them had psychiatric disorders independent of their substance use. Okay. Seven percent had a substance abuse disorder only. And 38% have both independent uh, and such independent psychiatric and substance abuse disorders. And I think this slide just highlights that too. You have this high, these things track together. So you're having substance abuse, it increases the risk of mood and anxiety. So that, that's those are those numbers there. You can see marijuana, there's a very high track with mood and anxiety, as is any drug. 
this is just something you've got to look for. Yes, yeah, so, and they, they do track together, but not necessarily independently. One does it by the other. Mm -hmm. um, it can complicate the course. And it makes things harder to treat. Exactly. So the real, and this is Elmo on fire, uh, <laughs> the, real, the real thing about all of this, I mean, we can throw all these numbers at you mm -hmm. all day long, but the real thing is you've got to ask, you've got to look. you got to expect, you got to look, right. you have to assess and reassess. Re because the first impressions can look very convincingly like something that will change over time. Yeah, and we get into that in a little bit because we talk about that psychosis. Absolutely, we, yes. So some obstacles to obtaining yeah, well, honest, accurate history, and we see this all day. Yeah, and the, and the degree of challenge can change, can change over time if somebody gets to feeling better, but uh, some, may, some may have uh, a substance abuse dementia, they can't recall, right. mm -hmm. um, there can be a psychosis from amphetamine use and, and distorted reality, mm -hmm. maybe in physical or emotional pain and not really wanting to talk about their history. Sociopathy yeah. uh, may play a part in how cooperative somebody is and uh, some people are in such denial that they truly really, uh, believe the distorted thoughts and thoughts and, exactly. and, and it makes it very convincing. Yeah. They, they really are um, in denial. So that makes Absolutely. it hard. So what we like to do when we see people that come in is we actually do some objective measurements. These are screens. Many of you out there probably are familiar with some of these. THQ9, it looks for depression symptoms. The MDQ, disorder questionnaire. Mm -hmm. uh, generalized anxiety disorder. The GAS-7 test for a lot of anxiety symptoms. Uh, treatment response scale is kind of a global scale. So we do yeah, all of these a wellness yeah. scale. When people come in, we do these tests. And interestingly enough, we do them on when they leave. And so we can actually look at how they're progressing because it's nice to understand are their symptoms getting better? And what is that normal there thing is, there, get better? There is frequently improved scores. Mm -hmm. And uh, they may improve from whether they're treated for a particular color or not, exactly. which is important uh, uh, when somebody comes in under the influence of a substance or in withdrawal, mm -hmm. not to jump to a diagnosis. So usually multiple scores are going to be high or and, and, and you make a working right. diagnosis mm -hmm. and you adjust as you go along. Um, but these are a piece of the supplemental information that one of you That we get, and, and we're lucky to be able to do this here. Absolutely. So I'm sure a lot of patients talk to you about the self-medication kind of hypothesis. And this is actually a, a doctor, Dr. Kantian, back um, many decades now came up with this theory that certain people gravitate to certain types of drugs or to alcohol because they're looking to treat a specific symptom, whether it's depression or mania or cognitive problems. And there's forward sometimes, you know, I'll hear often, they can't socialize. Exactly. You know, alcohol is a lubricant to feel better. And or a big go day between the people. offer a Xanax and right. feel better. And, well, there's my answer. Exactly. Feel better. I can go to the social mm -hmm. event now. Yeah. So th there's some um, reasonableness to this. I mean, mm -hmm. this theory makes sense for some people, but there's That's not for awesome. everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I bet a lot of people remember this ad. This was on TV in the 80s. This is your brain on drugs, um, the frying egg. Mm -hmm. um, the thing about this, this kind of theory is that addiction is more structural or biologically based. So we kind of take, a, take out of it what people might be feeling or their environment. We're just looking at the, the brain itself. I want to point out, just as, like, just as this egg is cooking and changing structurally, right. The that's brain, that's a great, I love that. Yeah. yeah, that's great. So there's good, there's good value to this theory or a hypothesis also. However, and I know this is a busy slide, bear with us. And it, it kind of conveys the complexity. It does. Yeah, I love that. You're yeah. right. Because it is very complex. It's not just biology. It's not just self-medication. It's about where people use. It's about their relationships. How accessible drugs are, their genetic yeah, pressure, their genetic predisposition, yeah. their yeah. ability, yeah. uh, and co-occurring disorders. And co-occurring disorders. <laughs> so, for instance. Yeah, for instance, we see that over 10% of the general population has experienced a depressive disorder at some point in their life. Uh, in our settings, maybe depression is really the most common co-occurring psychiatric disorder right. uh, found among those with uh, 
when you see SUD substance use disorder. And the lifetime prevalence rates range from 15 to 50 percent. I would say in our population, depression and anxiety right. here in our setting, and probably most of the time, right. over half of our population uh, will have a culture. I would say it's, yes, half. Sometimes three quarters. I think even closer to three quarters yeah. sometimes. Um, the next point, major depression among patients with SUD is correlated with worse outcome, worse psychiatric symptoms, and mm -hmm. highest height in suicide risk. True, if this is unidentified, unaddressed, I'm, I'm untreated, treated. I don't want this to be a pessimistic view. Uh, the optimistic side of this is we know that, right. and we can identify it, and we, and we can successfully. We see people recover from both all the time, and it's very rewarding. And uh, the bottom point talks about pharmacotherapy right. or medication management. Here we do group, individual, CBT, uh, trauma-focused care, we'll uh, yeah, exercise. Yeah. We'll get into a little more of those later. So bipolar, I think you mentioned this earlier, yeah. bipolar is actually less common than depression in people treating, seeking treatment for treat, for substance use. However, there is a stronger association. So somebody actually has a, uh, a primary use. bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. Uh, it increases their likelihood of uh, substance use disorder by four. Yeah. So there's a strong correlation there yeah. with somebody having an established bipolar disorder. Um, again, the last point co occurrence. Right. We see co occurrence back here. And in general, the risk of substance use disorder is less than Uh, double 
um, life by prevalence of um, anxiety and opiate use disorders. Not here, cannabis, cannabis, yeah. cannabis. I need to, I need to smoke to feel okay. I know. How many patients? Yeah, that all patients the time. tell us all the time. And I think you you brought up a great point is that there's a short term initial relief that people might get with cannabis or marijuana use. Mm -hmm. The long term risk is much greater because what's happening is it's just making that anxiety worse. And there's a whole host of other problems that come with yeah. marijuana use. I see it as a trap. Whether somebody's yeah. using uh, cannabis to relieve their anxiety acutely, having a, uh, a drink, uh, or taking opiates to, to relieve yeah. emotional or physical pain in the long run, all of it. It all gets worse. Yeah. Exactly. And there's other things that happen. So thinking about um, just going to the next one. Here we go. Psychotic disorders. So this is a very interesting slide because most there are a lot of substances you wouldn't even think about necessarily that can contribute to psychosis. Yes, I see it frequently with the higher concentrations of cannabis. Exactly. Um, yeah. Definitely you can see it with cocaine, mm -hmm. you can see it with Particularly these days, methamphetamine. Yes. Um, obviously, the hallucinogens, but maybe they're not quite as common on presentation right. as, as they have been. But right. uh, the amphetamines, uh, even alcohol. And alcohol. Yeah. yeah. They have a condition with alcohol. Mm -hmm. And uh, it looks, you know, looks like at least less than 50% of people still have psychosis after they give sobriety one month. So that's in, really interesting. In, in, in many cases, that helps you sort out mm -hmm. the primary psychotic disorder, the probably substance abuse. abuse. Uh, but that last point is important. Exception with methamphetamine induced right. psychosis is friend persists for a month, for month after yeah. accident. And um, uh, a young gentleman, uh, patient I've had here, uh, presented with psychosis. Mm -hmm. He was in treatment a few times, and each mm -hmm. time the psychosis was worse oh, and wow. persisted longer. Right. Unfortunately, the good news is he's still in recovery now as well, but um, it does affect one's cognition. Yeah, and, and I've seen that too. Absolutely. Yeah, and sometimes that cognition is hard to recover. I think another important point that this slide brings up is treatment needs to go on beyond that first month if you're inpatient. Absolutely. Again, we're talking about, talking about the timeline. Exactly. Our facility, we educate, we detox, mm -hmm. uh, we formulate a treatment plan, we make improvements, but this is a chronic brain disorder. It's the beginning of the step. And what's important in any treatment setting is coming up for the plan for complete the long right? aftercare. All the that's needed, whatever you do in the aftercare. So that's what we stress here. Exactly. And I think that's so important. So I think these numbers are amazing. Up to half of people with schizophrenia have a lifetime history of substance use. And that doesn't include tobacco and smoking. Yeah, which maybe, as it pointed out, uh, 70 to 90 percent association. Right, and, and all the bad health issues that come with tobacco, heart disease and uh, respiratory this illness. Another whole topic. Exactly, another webinar that will come up next month. <laughs> um, and so again, you get back to the idea that a comprehensive assessment mm -hmm. has to include a longitudinal history. You look at the symptoms, you look at just that collateral history, so talking to family or uh, people in their lives that know them really well, and then really looking for those medical conditions that are exacerbating or making these other issues worse. Right, and in fact, as I said, the one point intoxication, mm -hmm. withdrawal, delirium, dementia, uh, and other primary psychiatric disorders such as uh, uh, maybe depression or mania from bipolar disorder right. can all look like a primary psychotic disorder. You know, and, and, and true as well is what we're seeing with marijuana specifically, there are populations that are more affected by marijuana. They could, marijuana is theorized to trigger certain genes mm -hmm. to turn on. And, and turn someone into a primary psychosis. Primary psychosis, yes. uh, you know, the, the like schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. I had a young man who um, who used a lot of high concentrated THC, and enough over time he was diagnosed with schizophrenia, independent of the cannabis use. So it's really it's really quite um, remarkable to think about the complexity of that. Very So uh, you know some of the challenges about psychosis and substance is when you treat, how do you treat? You have to really integrate treatment. You can't leave right. one at the, at the expense of the other. You can't have a narrow scope right. uh, in treating addiction. Um, you can treat the addictive disorder, but if the other co-occurring conditions, problems, disorders aren't uh, assessed for, identified, treated, uh, long-term uh, uh, probability of continued sobriety 
speed is much lower. Is much lower. Yeah. Exactly. And this is a topic that comes up a lot for us. So I'm pivoting from psychosis, ADHD. Yeah, I have a, a lot of people that will present and say, I'm ADHD. Um, and you really sort that out, and a lot of them it's questionable. Uh, as it says on the slide, ADHD is over uh, represented with substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. Coexistence is going to reduce the effectiveness of treatment for either one of them. If it is there, it should be identified and appropriately right. treated. Right. Uh, but lots of times I'll have uh, uh, patients present that report they have a history of ADD, and I say, well, when did it start? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, when I was 40 and right. I was going to law school and I needed to concentrate for my exams, right. I went to the doctor and, and, gave him and I gave him some Adderall well, and he concentrated better. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, well you, 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 you might not really concentrate better, but right. that doesn't mean they have ADD. Exactly. So it's really critical to get that history again of symptoms and when they started. And I think it's also really hard to tell if someone has ADHD when they're in detox or they're in kind of longer term withdrawal because their their brain is just trying to reestablish a baseline. Right, and if they're still under the influence and yeah. in withdrawal, attention span is off and quite short. <laughs> um, but uh, it does, as the slide points out, adolescents are ADD do demonstrate right. earlier on that of substance use. Substance use. So I think it's, it's all the more important for the child. Psychiatrists, the pediatricians, the parents can really be in tune with symptoms and, and when people are much younger. Right, the education and guidance. Exactly. So, as far as studies with substance use and treating ADHD, um, you know, these are important things to consider is that making that diagnosis, you have to look for the symptoms before age 12. Uh, people really should be sober for at least two to four weeks. I would really move yeah, towards the longer, longer period longer. before mm -hmm. you make that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And you're really looking at what the risk factors are if there are adolescents with ADHD that don't get treated. Right. It, it's not really certain whether ADD alone increases the risk for later substance use disorder, but uh, when it is present, uh, it affects one's treatment response to substance use disorder if it's not identified and, right. and addressed. And it would increase the risk of heavier uh, substance use. Exactly. And there's really no clear cut guidelines. Yeah, <laughs> we hear this all the time. Can I be on my Adderall in recovery? And it comes to treatment. And comes to treatment. And you know, there's no clear cut guidelines. And and to be um, perfectly frank, I would be very nervous about putting someone on a stimulant um, when they're in recovery. And often. What I would love to see people do is change their lifestyle, ensure that they're getting good sleep, quality nutrition, exercise. There are non There are non for ADHD as well. Exactly. Uh, such as well, butrin, Quantine, Stratera. Stratera. And we do offer those. We do. We use those if it's appropriate. So trauma is another huge topic for us here. We even have a separate track. Yes, here at Lake U. Specialized track for those uh, with a history of trauma. So it's estimated in general that between 40 and 90 percent of the population have been exposed to some traumatic event at some point. Right. Uh, the ones with experience of trauma, 10 to 20 percent would develop PTSD. Uh, DSM-5 indicates a lifetime prevalence of around 8 and a half percent. Yeah. Um, and the National Comorbidity Replication Study found prevalence around 6.8. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, again, strong co-occurrence between PTSD and yeah. substance use disorder. Right. And, and particularly in the veteran population, yeah. uh, more than 2 out of 10 with PTSD also had a substance use disorder. And 1 out of 3 veterans seeking treatment for substance use also had a PTSD. And I've seen that uh, uh, verify out in our uh, in population. our population, too. And often PTSD precedes substance use. use. So again, this is a slide kind of highlighting, and I wish we had a, a nice picture too, a brain structure picture, but the, the patterns in the pathways, the neural pathways in the brain that are activated with trauma are also very similar to the ones activated with substance. So again, you're thinking about that, um, that break in the brain that doesn't turn, doesn't turn back on, that doesn't reduce that chronic fear people develop with PTSD. The, the, the mood and anxiety exactly. dysregulation that's, uh, that's uh, triggered by activation of these uh, circuits. Exactly. So, um, for instance, assessing this, you, you really want to do it post-intoxication and withdrawal. You don't want to catch someone when they're in active detox because you're not going to get a good picture. 
So you're always wanting to use using that working diagnosis. Working diagnosis, and we mentioned the clinic, clinician administer TPS right. scale or DSM-5. There are other mm -hmm. scales available. It's just an example of another way of gathering uh, the data, data. So that's exactly. and, yeah, exactly. in addition to one's interview and then your right. information with the collateral. And then there are there are treatments for PTSD, and they can include medicine. They can include specific therapy. therapies. Um, we use therapy. a number of those therapies here uh, at Lakeview. We do want to talk about benzos and PTSD. Yes, yeah, that's a great point because they actually have done some studies on benzos and PTSD. Benzos like Xanax and Valium and Clonopin actually make PTSD worse in the long term. So it goes back to what you were saying about the trap. Carolina, the trap. Mm -hmm. is that you feel better in that short interim right. period, but the longer you use, the worse your symptoms can become. So that's a really critical piece of it. And some will ask, well, if I had an event last week, mm -hmm. you know, and it's really affecting me, is there anything I can take to block the development? Yeah. And nothing really nothing reliable really about that. Yeah, we haven't identified anything yet. I say engaging in whatever therapies would be indicated right. as far as the medication, although I'm not going to block it. Personality disorders, we'll just touch briefly on these, we want to stay on time, but there are a high prevalence of the cluster B dramatic B personality in uh, substance. Borderline histrionic. And social. social. Most men get diagnosed with in a social. Most men. And women are borderline. Those are very common in treatment centers. Exactly. And, and there, in effect, uh, they're treatment out. Yeah. But, and, but you can treat people so it doesn't mean that they can't get healthy. Um, we actually do uh, recommend that they integrate treatment for the personality disorder in the treatment for the substance use because you, there are a number of good therapies out there. Absolutely, and occasionally pharmacotherapy or medications can be right. uh, applied for specific symptoms. So just a touch, um, to touch on special populations, so suicide, overdose deaths, and poly drug use, this is a, an area that I'm sure everyone's heard a lot about in the news. Those numbers are really unbelievable. 72,000 people lost in 2017 alone from an overdose death. And fentanyl is really the culprit. And this, this, not, this kind of graph here, it tracks the drug overdose death starting from like 1999 up until 2017. And I think the important piece of this graph is a lot of lines and everything, but what to take away is that we saw a spike in heroin around 2015 mm -hmm. contributing to drug overdose deaths. But what we're also finding is that fentanyl and, uh, well, prescription deaths in 2010 were a big issue, oxycodone, but heroin and now even fentanyl, you can see fentanyl like number six on that list from 2014, is contributing to drug deaths as well. Rising and rising. Rising and rising. And here in Jacksonville, we're seeing a ton of fentanyl-related overdose deaths. Yes, uh, with uh, many more patients reporting uh, they, what right. they thought was they, they were taking heroin than to be uh, at least right. to right. some degree of fentanyl, not only like like all fentanyl, fentanyl, fentanyl exactly. which is quite a surprise uh, related to focusing on what their tolerance has been previously. I know. And, and that way it contributes to the overdose, overdose deaths. deaths. And then, again, this is just highlighting that high fentanyl risk. And you can see it continually tracking higher throughout from 2014 on up. So an example of, of this kind of uh, phenomenon is Demi Lovato, who actually just celebrated a year of recovery in July, and she was on the cover of People Magazine. Mm -hmm. But she actually had an own near fatal overdose in July of 2018, and she thought she was getting one drug, oxycodone, and it turned out it was laced with fentanyl, and it had a number of other things in it. And she almost died because of this, but she got Narcan. Yeah. Narcan, and we just want to take a quick aside on Narcan, is a lifesaver. It can bring someone back from litter. It's a Lazarus drug. Mm -hmm. However, it's not treatment. It just saves a life. It doesn't mean that it's treating someone for that substance use. So get someone Narcan if they're in an overdose, but then get them in treatment. Absolutely. And, and we uh, suggest uh, to all of our patients uh, on discharge, uh, we offer them Narcan prescription. Exactly. It's available now in mm -hmm. a nasal spray formulation, which is so easy to administer in exactly. the face. Um, if someone is suspected of an opioid overdose, uh, this may save their life even mm -hmm. if uh, they've already stopped breathing exactly. for a short period of time.
Oh, exactly. They should keep it with AEDs. You should have, everyone should really have Narcan with them. Travel with it on a plane. Exactly. Given the statistics we saw exactly. in the recent slides, the uh, Narcan should stay be, alive. Yeah, pervasive yeah. in the environment and available. Now, this slide is just meant to highlight the idea that um, suicide is, is really baked into um, substance use, overdose deaths, as I, my suspicion, I know you and I talked about this. There's a high likelihood that people that are just labeled as an accidental overdose and may not be. They right. may be so depressed that they kind of wish they didn't wake up in the morning. Right. Uh, they really may not have a, a definite plan uh, for overdose, but I often have patients tell me uh, that they became more reckless, not worrying about the amount they were using, They're calculating, calculating and yeah. uh, they didn't uh, didn't mind if they didn't wake up. Exactly. And I'm sure a lot of that doesn't get calculated into the. And it's all, yeah, I can imagine it would be hard to measure, but it's an important thing I think to highlight that comorbidity. And, and the risk is really high for women. And I think this slide, along with um, a few other things we're going to show you, really highlights that women are at particular risk. Uh, you can see here the darker blue is where we see a, a spike with overdose deaths, and Florida is dark blue. We're, we're blue. <laughs> and the deaths of despair, again, thinking about someone who is dealing with a depression, with alcohol, with overdose deaths. We, um, you particularly know West Virginia West well. Virginia area is uh, interviews frequently for uh, this topic, and mm -hmm. uh, you see just in West Virginia alone a fourfold uh, An increase. Exactly, and that just highlights that as well. Is that different parts of the country are struggling with different issues? So the Northeast struggle with more the Midwest and West with alcohol and suicide. And we really just need strategies to kind of figure out what's going on. Is it really an accidental overdose? Again, it highlights that need for good psychiatric for good evaluation. Evaluation at the outside because if these can be identified, treated, it's going to reduce the suicide risk. It's going to reduce uh, uh, continued symptoms and improve chances for long-term survival. So this is Anthony Morgan. And I have to tell you, when I heard about his uh, suicide, I immediately thought about his substance use because he was very open about his problems. Mm -hmm. Turns out that he actually hung himself. Mm -hmm. He was depressed, but he was also sober. So that also highlights the idea that we have to ask, we have to evaluate. We don't know if he was in treatment. Right. We don't know what his circumstances were, but it really highlights that comorbidity. And then Prince who had an accidental um, uh, opiate overdose. Mm -hmm. And he actually had a lot of medical issues. He originally was treated with pain meds because of a back injury. He fell off the stage. Mm -hmm. And hip injury. And hip injury, exactly. And then you told me this is one of your favorite yeah. singers. <laughs> and this um, talent, you know, it does not discriminate. The talent, the, the money, the fame, actually does not protect people from having the same struggles as your everyday guy. And then little peep. And I think here this, this story kind of highlights the idea that this, this young man had a lot of um, poly drug use, mm -hmm. cannabis, cocaine, prescription drugs. Which is relevant to one of the questions. It is. You're right. <laughs> poly drug use. So one of the things that we just want to touch on is, is the treatment for co-occurring. Mm -hmm. And we can spend a whole webinar on just this. But as you can see, physical exercise, ECT, TMS, and specialized therapies are going to be really key. That biopsychosocial approach, you know, that comprehensive looking at that, that whole person is so important. And, and an example of that is the COPE program in West Virginia. It is, with Dr. Jane Ferry. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll talk about that. The yeah. addiction treatment program. And what they do is they just they take a whole um, biopsychosocial approach. They use medicine, but they're using individual therapies. Group group therapy. Well, stuff, exactly. Yeah. So physical exercise studied by um, Dr. Thanos in Buffalo actually shows that it can restore brain chemistry. One of my favorite antidepressants. Exactly, one two. Three to five days, 30 to 45 minutes. If you just remember that, that is the, the recommendation from that study. And here at Lakeview? We have a beautiful wellness center. center. We have physical, physical therapists. therapists. We have physical Personal trainers. trainers. We uh, incorporate this into the treatment for all our very, very important, very, 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 very positive people. So m and just celebrated 11 years of recovery, which is great. He's also on People Magazine. Mm -hmm. And he um, he just found that 
getting exercise really helped his brain um, restore. Although he didn't drift into cross addiction, he ended up running too much daily and lost a lot of weight. But he was running he was up to 230 pounds, but he had an overdose. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it highlights the importance of following along with a professional and getting guided yeah. in, in, in one's treatment. Yep. And this just talks about how important it is to have that psychiatric evaluation. Um, tools that doctors can use. So Kitty Dukakis, she had alcohol and depression. She was treated with ECT, shock therapy. Um, but a newer version is TMS. We offer here, I exactly. Think and TMS right now is FDA approved for depression. However, there's a lot of fascinating studies looking at it for um, relapse so prevention, craving, sleep, mm -hmm. mood. Um, it targets the prefrontal, which is mm -hmm. wonderful. So there might be a study written in in, 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 in exactly. uh, cocaine cravings. I know, and that's really exciting because there's no drug right now that helps with that. Important point. Uh, note, note the areas of stimulation: dorsal, lateral, medial, prefrontal, prefrontal cortex, and the interior. Exactly. And again, it's a big <laughs> the complexity. Once you re-emphasize the complexity, yeah. the, and it's really just all about giving it a very thorough evaluation and treatment. Therapy, CBT, social rhythm therapy, you had a thing. Right, yeah, an yeah, ER doctor. ER doctor uh, who didn't really apply social, because of his job and shift work, couldn't apply social rhythm therapy very well. Uh -huh. and despite being compliant with his uh, yeah. medication, he still was symptomatic yeah. frequently with his bipolar illness. And so in those patients, I really emphasize normal exactly. routine. Yes. We yes. exercise, uh, uh, establishing a normal circadian rhythm. So, why treat? It's important. It's, it's important. <laughs> it's effective. Uh, improves quality of life. Treat the rate of absolutely. Yeah. Um, Save lives. Save lives. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So, we are at our question section. We kind of zip through a little bit towards the end because we've got so much to tell you. How many slides is this? Uh, we, we can talk about we this love all day long. Topic. It's a great so, topic. And, so we welcome any questions. So um, we left out medical comorbidities. We can really talk about that month. Month. Yeah. So please tune in next month. We're going to get really deep into the medical piece, which you're the expert on there. <laughs> <laughs> Expectations. Yes, exactly. It's stay tuned. All right. Anybody has any questions, send them our way. Well, we really did well, or we really confused everybody. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any questions popping up yet. No? Oh, yeah, okay. so that great point. Um, Ashley's reminding me that our slides will be available. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know what? I think it would be nice if someone had a question, you know what? Save it for next month because we can address those as well. And we really want to give good info to everybody. We'll and thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you from Lakeview, Jacksonville.